One of the difficulties for me in picking a moment of 2020 is the first I had to try to remind myself exactly what a moment was. Let's face it, there were moments this year that seemed to last for months and months when it was hard to remember what day it was. And consulting the cycling calendar wasn't much help. There's nothing particularly odd, for example, about spending a late October afternoon watching the leaves fall. But watching them fall on the peloton on stage one of the Vuelta is something that takes a bit of mental processing. So that's an abiding image of 2020 for me, if not a moment. And so is the sight of a shell-shot Primoz Roglic with his helmet askew, pushing himself to the line on the penultimate stage of the Tour de France, already knowing that he'd lost both the time trial and the race to Tadej Pogacar. Although it was immediately superseded in memorability by a show of grace and generosity in picking himself up off the pavement to congratulate the man who'd just defeated him. That was definitely a moment, but not the moment. For me, that came earlier in the Tour, on day two with a routinely brilliant victory by Julien Alaphilippe, after which he sat down and sobbed. Like many of his fans, it turned out the great Frenchman was returning to work after lockdown, still struggling through a bereavement, having lost his father in the summer on what would have been the tour's opening weekend had it taken place as originally scheduled. Les moments un peu un peu plus durs. Voilà, je voulais juste dédier cette victoire à mon papa. Ça me tenait à cœur et je suis vraiment content de d'y être arrivé. There were other perhaps greater moments for Julien Alaphilippe this year. The week after the Tour finished, of course, he became world champion. But that's the one that stuck with me and seemed most worth passing on to you. Longo Borghini riding gamely on. Can she still be a factor here, the other rider from Trek Segafredo? Watch out for her. She might just appear down the middle of the road. Dijkman is almost waiting for her, waiting for her teammate to try and get past. Longo Borghini is on. Longo Borghini goes on the right-hand side of the road. That was the signal that Dijkman was waiting for. She knows that Voss has to react, and that is the cue for Dijkman to watch that orange jersey. The two great rivals now drawing to the front. Voss, though, powering away from Dijkman, and Voss is going to make Make it two out of two at La Corsa, unless Dijkman can close the gap again. Dijkman coming back alongside the Dutch rider. Dijkman challenging her all the way. Two of the very best. And Dijkman with a lunge at the line, I think, takes victory from Mariana Vos. And that was a tactical and powerful masterclass from Lizzie Dijkman. Rolling back the years, what a finish that was. In a year when pretty much everyone on the planet had their lives disrupted and tragedies became commonplace, it's hard to talk about positives, but they were there. For millions of people, the escape from stress and in some cases grief was provided by this wonderful two-wheeled marvel. We got to work, took exercise, entertained ourselves and our bored kids with this simple device, millions of people for the very first time. And when we got home, we turned on our TVs to watch some of the world's best athletes go at it. And go at it they did. Incredibly, the 2020 season, whilst amended and truncated, provided some of the very best sporting moments the cycling world has ever seen. Toddy Pogacar and Primoz Roglic were at the centre of it all, battling across France in a nip and tuck contest, culminating in one of the Grand Boucle's most compelling time trials. It wasn't just the sporting spectacle that enthralled us though, as the young Slovenian slowly overhauled his countrymen, it was the emotional connection. Over three weeks we came to like and respect both of them. So we cheered as Pogacar pulled ahead, and then seconds later, as Roglic's stunned face came into view, suddenly we were with him, feeling the loss as his lifetime dream slipped away at the last. And that's why we watch sport, I suppose, the play without a script, gripping and absorbing. Exactly what we needed in 2020. So thank you to the sportsmen and women who gave us that, who stayed away from their loved ones so that we could ride with them. Carthy has, uh, I hesitate to use the word attack on these climbs because the, the speeds are so slow, aren't they? That you can yeah. barely call it a, an attack. It's a, it's a move off the front from Carthy and a strong one too. And he is leaving Carapaz and Mass at this point. And see what Hugh Carthy's doing? This is a ride for the win. And he's, he's read that and he's riding it perfectly. And he's not just doing it tactically. The strength is enormous to be able to do what he's doing right now. This is Hugh Carthy is making a big difference here. Enrique Mass is doing an amazingly gauged effort from being the, 
the, essentially the rider who did provoke all this action, and he's still there. Vlatsov is just picking them back one by one. 300 meters to go, the climbing is done, and he's going to win. What a ride this is from Hugh Carthy. By far the biggest thing he's ever done on a bike, building to this moment throughout his career. What a sensational turnaround. A fantastic ride from Hugh Carthy. Inside the few last few meters, he celebrates victory on Ankleru, one of the greatest climbs in the world. He has now taken one of the biggest wins in bike racing. To win a top the angry route is for a climber like what it is for a sprinter winning the Champs-Élysées. Almost impossible to pick the best cycling moment of 2020 because there were so many to choose from. But perhaps slightly counterintuitively, I'm going to go for um, a race that happened a couple of weeks before the Tour of Flanders, which itself was absolutely uh, phenomenal. And I'm going to pick stage five, the final stage of uh, the Bink Bank Tour, right? Okay, now that may sound like a bit of a hipster choice, but the reason I'm going for that is because on the final stage of the Big Mac Tour, which is a great race, by the way, Mathieu van der Poel had to do everything. He had to win solo with a gap, a substantial gap. He had to take time bonuses on the road and time bonuses at the finish line to get it done. Uh, should have been impossible, especially given the quality of the group uh, that was chasing him and trying to prevent him from doing that. The likes of Søren Krau Andersen and Stefan Kung and um, uh, Oliver Narsen. But he just did it through uh, sheer brute strength and uh, indefatigable will. And it was close and it was thrilling. And it was um, my race of 2020. Mathieu van der Poel, final stage of the Bink Bank Tour. As De Koenig quick steps Michael Mercou with Sam Bennett on his wheel. Take that crucial last right-hander. And how long and deep can Mercou go with the Irishman on his wheel now? Jasper Stuven now sprinting with Bas Pedersen on his wheel. Bennett on the wheel of the world champion. Viviani with a rush up the right. All of them sprinting at maximum velocity now. Bennett on the right-hand side. Sagan on his wheel. Bennett powering clear. Bennett's going to win on the Champs-Élysées in green. The history maker, Sam Bennett. And his team delivered him there to perfect. Perfection! What a lead out from Moku. Look at how much that means to Bennett. That's huge. All that pain that he endured in the Alps. <laughs> the stage win in green, special. Well, it should be easy to choose one highlight from a shortened season like 2020, but it's not. I can hardly remember so many great races back to back and sometimes on the same day. My choice took place on the 8th of August. It was Milano Sanremo Day in Italy, but we are far to the north at the tour of uh, Poland. It's stage four around the town of Bukovina. With 65 kilometers to go, the race leader, Richard Carapaz, uh, the winner of the previous day's stage, crashes out of contention. And uh, Remco Evenepoel looks around himself and sees lots of team leaders and not many domestiques. So what does he do? With 51.7 kilometers to go, he sprints out of the group, uh, opens a gap, gets down into a tuck and rides away. Uh, on the finish line, he's got the presence of mind to uh, pull out of his pocket uh, the dossard of his teammate Fabio Jakobsen, the uh, victim of the most notorious incident of the season, the big crash at the end of stage one. Uh, he pays homage to his fallen teammate. Uh, he celebrates the race win. One minute, 48 seconds from the rider who finishes second, Jakob Fuglsang. So that gives you an idea of the quality of the attack. And he broadcasts a message to the rest of professional cycling and to us too. He's 20 years and seven months old and already he's capable of a ride like that. You have the yellow jersey on your shoulder. What does it mean for you? Yeah, look, it's not the, it's not the way I imagined taking a jersey. Um, I'm not even sure what's happened to Julian. Um, I heard he got a time penalty or something for for taking a feed late or something, but uh, yeah, if I'm honest, I don't think anybody wants to take a jersey like this, um, but I guess we'll wear it tomorrow. <laughs> the best race of the season has to be Criterium du Dauphiné, Stage 5, and maybe the race overall, which seems weird to say because the two race favourites, Bernal and Roglic, had pulled out uh, with injuries as a precaution before the Tour de France. Thibaut Pinot leading GC about 30 seconds ahead of Daniel Martinez going into Stage 5, which started and finished in Megève, very hilly stage to I think an HC and a Cat 1 climb in the first third of the race and with no Jumbo Visma controlling the race because Roglic wasn't there which is what we had to see in the Tour de France the entirety of the Tour de France except for the time trial really with none of that control it descended into chaos straight away you had 
Alaphilippe attacking with Sivakov. Sepkus had been freed, he ran out the eventual stage winner. You had Pogacar attacking on the last ascent of the Domancy, I think, followed then by Lopez, Kuss, and Danny Martinez. Thibaut Pino couldn't follow them. He'd attacked earlier in the stage, I think, and actually gapped Danny Martinez. And so Martinez, with Lopez only six seconds behind him on GC, had to hold something in reserve whilst also trying to open up the gap on Thibaut Pino, who was trying to overcome on GC. Pino, after a very hard stage from the start, and the numbers proved that it was one of the highest level performances from all the riders across the stage in a long time. Pino put in a monumental effort and it didn't end up being enough. There were other French riders trying to help him. I remember Alaphilippe actually selflessly working for Thibaut Pino after he'd been dropped by the Martinez and Kuss group. It was Danny Martinez really showing that he is a top class rider, going to Ineos next year, taking out the big upset for the GC victory. He would have been well over 100 to one for the Dauphiné before the race started.